Hello and welcome to another episode of the Collab Talk podcast, where we discuss the convergence of technology, business productivity, and collaboration culture. My guest today is Oren Amy, Microsoft MVP, the CEO and founder of RavenDB. Welcome, Oren. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. We're this is a great topic. Uh, you know, where we talk about collaboration in the broadest sense and everything around it. And I, but I love talking about community building specifically. So community is a cornerstone and building business on open source foundations, which uh, uh, again, given your background, given what mm-hmm. you focus on, but you're also an MVP. I mean, you know, so that's like, that's perfect. Cause I work in and out of the Microsoft ecosystem as well. And it's always interested to, to, interesting to look at the comparisons of what I see around Microsoft community building and then my past, which is, you know, open source and IBM working with rational software 25 years ago, you know, uh, building up community in, in both of those areas and seeing some of the differences, but why don't we kick things off first or introduce yourself more fully, talk about what is your company? What do you do? What does your company do? Okay. So my name is Oren. I've been working on software development for 25 years at this point. For the past 15 years or so, I've been working on RavenDB, which is a document database. Uh, It is written in C Sharp. It has a really good uh, link provider and C Sharp driver. And the whole goal of RavenDB is to be a really boring database, something that, in the same sense that may you live in interesting times is a Chinese skills, Mm -hmm. then uh, have a boring database is a really good blessing because it means that you don't have to deal with all of the uh, minutia of EBITDA's mismatch or data complexity or have to spend all day figuring out why my system is slow. You can just get things working. And that's what... I aim to do with RevenDB. The, the the reason it even exists is I used to be a database consultant spe- specializing in ORMs, object relation mappers. Uh, think about think about an Hibernate entity framework, uh, link to SQL, those sort of things. Mm-hmm. And I got so tired of seeing people fall into the same pitfalls each and every time, doing really really stupid things time time again. Not stupid people, really, really smart people who will focus on doing, oh, I need to get this feature out of the door, and they basically fell into a hole uh, that would suck a lot of time, performance, and effort to fix. Yeah. Uh, and I created RevenDB because I really had this idea, what if I could fix that? And it tells us that you cannot fix that in at the ORM level. You have to build an actual database to do that. So that has been about yeah 15 years ago or so, uh, slightly longer than that because I started thinking about and uh, how I can do that in 2007. And it's interesting because I did not, and I cannot emphasize that enough, I did not want to create a database. I was forced to do that by this burning desire, this this need to get it out of the door. I remember being woken up at the middle of the night, staring at the ceiling and having this minority report-like episode where I'm seeing different components fly around and combine. I I know how to make it work. Like, I I don't have have the words of expressing the the level of inspiration that, that gave me and that drove me. And at the same time, being in a database is a huge amount of work. And mm. speaking as someone who has paid the mortgage using the, the database for a while, I have been absolutely stupid to do that because this is such a huge task. And one of the things that I, and I even very early on, I realized this is a huge task. So I have, uh, so I did something that I was very proud of and I, 
decided, okay, I cannot get it out of my head. It has to go. I have to spend the time in actually uh, working on that. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that this was more than a full-time job. I was start, I was working eight, 10 hours a day on my normal job. And then I would spend the whole night hacking on RevenDB. And I would spend more time on RevenDB than many years because it was such an amazing uh, experience and drive and whatever you want to, to do that. But at some point I look at my financials, I said, hey, that's a problem. You know, I'm not getting paid for that. Uh, so I came up with a appropriate solution for that. And I like to call it my, uh, uh, the stop loss function. So at what point do I stop before I lose the shot? Okay, so uh, I sat down and I had a business plan. I had a napkin and it says, okay, I'm going to invest this amount of money, this amount of time into doing that. And I have to be able to make money so, you know, I can eat. Uh, and this is the point where I would be able to rest and say, okay, I've done my best. I cannot make it work from a financial uh, uh, sense. I can, I have to put it aside. That yeah. that was my stop loss function. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that people really, really liked that. Really liked the database. They were willing to pay me to build this database. And I've been doing that professionally for quite a while now. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the same time, one of the things that I think is really interesting, RevenDB is an open source project. It's released under an OSI approved license. You can look at the code, you can modify the code, you can deploy the code on or distribute it yourself. At the same time, I have to be able to pay for that. And that is a really complex thing to do. Uh, If I want to bring some uh, current uh, events into this podcast, then consider the XZ uh, fiasco that we just had, where uh, a critical vulnerability was added maliciously Mm -hmm. to a well-known community project simply because there is one maintainer and he's tired of, you know, doing maintenance for the past 20 years or so. So when someone volunteered to uh, do all of some grant work, he says, yeah, sure, go ahead and do that. And apparently if you spend two years doing something, then you get some trust and that is a bad vector for supply chain attacks. Mm. Uh, a similar scenario was with uh, OpenSSL, uh, and where there was the help lead attack, and people realized that you know here is this library where the entire world is based on, mm-hmm. and there are two guys doing maintenance of that, basically because they feel like it. <laughs> That's not a sustainable model for something like that. Yeah. And uh, that, that I think happened, uh, dear God, I think it was a decade ago or something, because I cannot remember at this point. But um, that, that's actually really an important issue when you think about how we structure software today. Because in almost all cases, you, you're never going to build software starting from you know a blank C file and the C compiler, that's it, and you build everything from there. You're going to have components, you're going to reach out for uh, what is there, whatever this is on NuGet or NPM or PyPy or whatever. So, and most of those things are going to be open source. And to a large extent, you want that, and this, this is highly desirable, but at the same time, who is paying for that? Who is paying for ongoing care and maintenance. Uh, with GitHub, we have a really nice feature, the dependable that tells me that, oh, here is, uh, uh, there is some vulnerability in some tertiary dependency that I have on some NPM package in a project that I last touched 10 years ago. So I'm not touching that. I'm not going near this thing to just even figure out how to build that on my machine means that, uh, oh, I don't have node six anymore. I don't know where to find it. So there is 
an actual ongoing course on ensuring something like that happen. And that is a huge issue, both from a community perspective and from an industry perspective. Uh, yeah, there, there's, you know, having been you know, not non-developer, I understand a lot of the issues though with open source project, having participated in, you know, going back again, 25 years ago, was on a uh, board with the Global Grid Forum. They're trying to, so with the standards bodies that was, you know, uh, working with a number of the different companies here is, you know, one, I mean, I always was also always grateful um, for the various, the sponsorships, meaning large companies that would donate time. So they were paying for employees to go and give time to a lot of these initiatives that helps. I mean, it's, it's great when you find altruistic people on their own time, just out in the community that are trusted, that have been there for a while. Mm -hmm. um, it's, but you also need to have, um, uh, you know, uh, these participants from sponsoring companies that want to, they, they have a, 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 you know, an interest in seeing, you know, these efforts move forward and be successful and be safe. Um, to to help fund those things it's funny it's there's always uh again you get the purists that are in open source community they're like we don't want corporations we don't want to have these big brands and things that are in there it's like you know who, who do you think are the people that have the time that have the effort you know to, to put behind it? it it's a mixture it it's, needs to be unbiased it needs to be neutral it's it's a huge issue because if this is a label of love and for most people uh, the the um, I, I don't know how to say that the, the ideal, the, the, the best case scenario for a open source contribution is that you do that from a position of love. That's amazing. And okay, sure, that's the best thing ever. But at some point you have the uh, maintainers and they need to be able to, you know, eat and they need yeah. to be able to uh, uh, manage uh, their time and effort and who wants to write uh, yet another integration test or, or I need to make sure this works in uh, .NET standard 2.0 and that's annoying because there's missing API or whatever and I now need to make sure that I have a reproducible build or any of the uh, married level of chores that you get off that. And if you look at open source in general, in general, uh, you can typically divide them into few categories. I'm going to ignore right now the case of personal projects, or I want to build something, and this is not something huge, like my blog engine or something like that, and I'm using that to learn. That's great. I'm not touching that. But I'm talking about stuff that actually get used by other people. So either this is a byproduct of something that I do for work. For example, maybe I need to have really good authorization library. So I would write that and I need it for a project. And I would write it and it fits my needs. And I would make it open source because, hey, why not? This is not my core competency. Maybe someone can use that. Maybe someone can uh, make it better. That's fine. Uh, take that over the long haul, and that's a huge problem because now there is uh, the community that you get around this product, around this uh, this thing, now has an issue. I don't need this to be a generic. I need it to fit my specific scenario. Mm -hmm. So either I tell you go and fork the project, and or I start accepting outside contributions and lose control, some control of the project or something like that. At the same time, if I'm the head of the project, I still need to review code and still need to maintain it. Any, uh, oh, I need to make an addition to the code. I have to take care of scenarios that I don't actually have, mm -hmm. but, I have, but they're your awesome, but I still have to take, to take them on themselves. Uh, one of the things that people may not realize for open source project is that, oh, you're asking me for my code, or maybe you even ask me for copyright assignment or something like that. When an open source project accepts your codes, in most cases, they also accept ownership on that over the long haul. 
And this can be an enormous uh, burden to bear for many projects. And now we are talking about, okay, how do I make money out of that? And people try to, to say, oh, if I'm looking at open source project and money, that's like uh, uh, diluting the, the value or something like that. But at the end of the day, if you want to have a professional uh, developer and the attention and care that needs, you have to pay for that. Otherwise, you know, going back with, I created this uh, this project for, uh, this open source project for this scenario that I have, but now I move from building, you know, a retail application to healthcare. So I'm not longer maintaining the barcode scanner, whatever it is that I uh, used to do before. I don't have the time for that. And now, you may have taken a, a dependency on me. And now you get into a really, really bad place where even if you wanted to pay me, I may not be able to, uh, I don't know, uh, it depends on the jurisdiction, but for example, in Israel, uh, if I'm a full-time employee mm -hmm. and you want to pay me outside of that, it's a major hustle. I have to go and get an accountant. I have to get a uh, possibly get legal legal approval. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, right. yeah, leave it, yeah. leave it. I'm even leaving aside the fact that my job may need to approve that. Yeah. Just the, the bureaucratic hassle of being able to issue an invoice and report to the tax authorities. Yeah. At one point, uh, and people may. Uh, severely underestimate the complexity. Like if you send me money, I have to be able to show that that money was sent for a commercial viable because otherwise the bank would assume that you send me money for drugs. <laughs> and I would have to prove that this money is not from drugs, for not, not, not for drugs and crazy stuff like that. So the, the cost of actually getting money if I'm already, you know, employed, is actually much higher than people expect. So, yeah. oh, I cannot just, you know, why you 500 shekels, $500 or whatever, and you can spend an evening or two hacking or something. And that leads to, okay, if this project needs to have actual money behind that, how does it actually gather this money? And now we have uh, a few options. One of them is the foundation model. So the classic one would be the Linux Foundation, Mozilla. Right now, a small foundation that exists is the Zig Language Foundation. And they're basically saying, we're getting sponsorship from or donation or something like that, and we will mm -hmm. hire people to do that. Yeah. Uh, Zig is a really nice uh, new language. It looks amazing. It has very nice capabilities. And one of the incidental capabilities that it has, it is a really good build engine for completely different reasons for the core competencies of the project. Many people choose to use Zig not as the language, but as compiler for C project because, or C++ project because it makes it easy. And if you think about it, okay, now we have people who are you know paying $50,000 as a company to basically to have a good build engine, but the core of the foundation, what they want to do is I want to build a good language. So totally different uh, uh, mindset. And at the end of the day, if people are paying money for you to you know, build a build engine, that would have a major shift on the, on the direction of the project. Yeah. Some, some reason that uh, Mozilla makes most of, most of money from Google uh, sponsorship and things like that. That's a huge aspect of how things are working. And yeah. A lot, I'm just going to say this, like a lot of people that, uh, again, the purists uh, out in the uh, open source world that get upset when, uh, you know, Microsoft or some other major company, you know, forks a, a solution and goes and builds things. It's like, well, like anything, you have to look at if I'm not, if I'm waiting for Microsoft to build and extend because I'm interested in certain integrations and the path that they're going, but I have the same problem with the open source that I'm waiting to somebody have the time to somebody interested in, you know, building out the functionality to, capability that I that I want. You have that problem either direction. To a certain extent, one of the uh, 
It used to be the case, if we're going back uh, 15, 20 years ago, it used to be the case that Microsoft has a blank policy in open source. Mm-hmm. And if you wanted to have something for Microsoft, then they would have to build it themselves. If you remember, there used to be the enterprise library, which would curate all sorts of interesting patterns from the open source and give them their blessing by issuing basically code droplets that you would use. Basically, it was like open source, but for Microsoft, and that's about it. And that caused a huge amount of problems and balkanization of the community, because if you were, if you wanted to do the best thing, you would go and use the open source projects because they were the most up-to-date, they were the fastest, most capabilities, and if you were tied to the Microsoft Dragon, then you would use the Enterprise Library, which was typically, in terms of patterns, behavior, etc., would be at least a couple of uh, uh, years behind right. the... The two, uh, three uh, year cycle, right. Yeah. Yeah, and it was also tend to be a lot more cumbersome and enterprising and all much of other stuff like that. Right. Uh, but the weight of the Microsoft brand name on any team was so huge that it basically choked the open source community. Mm-hmm. And uh, even to this day, if you look at the uh, login interface and DI interface, uh, it used to, there used to be a really vibrant community. I was part of it in .NET around uh, dependency injection containers and inversion of control and all sorts of stuff like that. And now we have the iService provider that is provided by uh, Microsoft, and almost everyone just use whatever is in the box. Mm-hmm. And I think that we lost a lot of capabilities and experimentations and everything like that, just because, you know, okay, uh, Microsoft did it, it's sufficient for our use case, it may not be the best thing, but, you know, we deal with that. And that's it. And the uh, issue of Microsoft issuing something like that and then basically killing the community around that. And again, Entity Filmwork is a great example of that. I used to be in the Hubble project and the Entity Filmwork uh, basically competed with that with a lot bigger resources. Um, And that's a problem. And the other hand, okay, now I have a uh, an owner, a known owner for uh, this project. But if you have a enterprise library project today, then you're in a very bad place. If we look at the history of Microsoft in terms of a, a silver light and light switch, and I can, and I, uh, uh, xaml based technology that I no longer bother to keep track of and things like that. That's not a good place to be. Yeah. And then you have the uh, huge shift with .NET in particular of moving to open source uh, uh, model. So I have code right now that I wrote that is in the uh, .NET SDK. Mm-hmm. Uh, my, minor bug fixes mostly and things like that, but I was able to narrow down the, here is the problem, here is the fix, here is the uh, pull request. I did whatever dance you needed to do in order to get it to uh, properly apply, but it worked. Hmm. And that is such a huge shift, such a major uh, 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 difference that I cannot express how much it is, except when I'm uh, uh, comparing that to how it used to be. So let me uh, uh, give you an example. In 2008-2007, there was a bug, and the bug was that uh, if you you ask, uh, I remember that because it's such a ridiculous thing, if you ask the uh, bool converter, whatever can convert foo to bool, it would say yes. If you call convert on foo, it would draw. So it's a bug where it would accept basically any string and that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's how you fix it. 
you open a, a, a bug in something called Microsoft Connect. I don't remember if you remember that. I still have nightmares. Uh, where bugs would go to die. I don't know if anyone looked at them uh, because, uh, but for that particular bug, someone, uh, I assume that an RD or MVP or something like that, made someone look and it was closed as won't fix because of backward compatibility issue. And that was like such a ridiculous thing, uh, such as an, an opaque process. Uh, that you have no communication with who did it, uh, it was typically uh, 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 weeks or months after you actually made a report. And even if you had actually generated uh, an issue, a real issue, uh, oh, uh, I remember there was one time uh, if you did a for loop on a particular framework, then you would get the wrong JIT cycle and it would create a null reference exception. I remember looking at this issue, and again, I'm talking about 15, 20 years ago, looking at this issue and having my fate in C-sharp basically being shattered because of a JIT bug. Because what, those things happen? You can have bugs in the just-in-time compiler, like, uh, and today, you know, uh, yeah, all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but, okay, yeah, we, uh, they, uh, so Microsoft at this point who says, oh yeah, this is a, this is a problem. Uh, here is the issue number for that, and it will be resolved in the next service pack in six to 12 months. Oh, you, if you really, really want, you may have a hotfix, uh, but you have to have a support contract and talk to us privately and justify what you want. Now, if I'm working on open source project, I cannot rely on this hotfix because I don't know if my users would have that. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I would have to go and find a workaround somehow. And versus today, first of all, I'm talking to the actual people who's writing the code. Am I talking about me? I'm talking about anyone on GitHub that talks to GitHub slash .NET slash runtime. Mm -hmm. And you get to talk to them. You get to uh, uh, pick the brain. What, what, what about this? What about this? I have a problem. I don't know how to solve that. They would give me an answer about, uh, uh, oh, here's a few things that you can try that may uh, 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 shed some light about what's going on. Uh, and the reason this matters is that, oh, they don't have a solution for me. I can go and fix that and I can carry my own version of the framework until that gets resolved. And I've done that in the past running on the custom version. Mm -hmm. And that is really kind of amazing when you think about it, Versus, especially because that's how it's supposed to be. But again, going back to um, business and, uh, and open source. So the model where, uh, like .NET, where you have a project that is wholly owned by Microsoft and it's released as open source and they maintain the... Uh, the, the development team for that is not something that is broadly applicable. Think about what do you need to do in order to be a member in the G team for Microsoft, the level of knowledge and uh, expertise that you need. So those are not people that you can just find off the street. Mm. Uh, they are, so you mentioned uh, uh, IBM and sponsorship and hiring people to work on those projects. And it works. It's a viable way of doing that. I think that uh, the creator of Python, who's Van Guido, but I cannot pronounce the first name, uh, used to work for a long time for Microsoft. And again, as the benevolent dictator for uh, Python. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, that is uh, such a limiting factor because you cannot make that into a... You, you couldn't get Microsoft to, to sponsor every uh, open source project in the world. That's not, right. obviously, not even well, for them that is that no, the, sustainable. Of course. The, what, what I, was, I was using an example, too, is that they're, they're selfishly going to pursue what makes sense for their products. This is something, another aspect, though, of the, the open source world that I, I feel like sometimes need to, uh -huh. I find myself explaining to, again, the, on the, the purest side, um, have some interactions them through user groups and, and other things is that um you know software companies anybody who's in business like at the end of the day you you talked about your own experience 
you, you need to pay your bills. You, you, there's, and so you're going to do things. You're going to shape like features that you prioritize may be driven by customer de demand. So it's increasingly important to look at um, even in open source initiatives to take, you know, from voting members to look at what should we prioritize, what directions should we go, what we should go work on. You're not always going to find somebody who's so altruistic to say, yes, I will go and build that for you and move in that direction. And I was like, no, they'll, they, they all have, for the most part, selfish reasons for doing that because it impacts their own job, their own products, their company's, uh, you know, initiatives, th those efforts. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're all, we, we need to be data driven to some, some level um, of what our customers want and build out focus on those things accordingly. Again, my company is looking for certain features. We may then go and sponsor some of our engineers to spend time in these open source projects and, to, to dedicate yeah, their time. But but let's let's talk about this. Let's talk about what I think is the uh, biggest problem with open source in general. Let's say that you have a project, the project is, a, you know, it's not a huge, you know, multi-billion project, but it's also not a small one. And you made a decision to utilize some open source project. Now you realize that there is something that you're missing and you want to have that. And at that point, you realize that, hey, i not sure that I can actually do something like that. I mean, let's say that you have a team of uh, C-sharp developers and this project is written in Scala the amount of time that you're going to have to spend to train your people, forced to understand uh, uh, how to work with Scala projects, and then in order to understand this particular project, how to optimize that, and what's going on uh, is insane. So you only do something like that only for, uh, uh, you know, the core of your business. Like many, many uh, uh, companies would have, uh, 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 at least many big companies would have a team that is uh, I'm expert in the uh, Linux kernel because I need to be able to go and debug and understand what's going on something like that but how many experts do you have on the uh, uh, let's say the ZFS file system okay also a pretty foundational thing and if you have a bug there you know you, you want to be able to have an owner, uh, you know, a parent, somebody you can complain to. And at that point, you realize that uh, the model of open source breaks from an individual contributor perspective, contributing to open source is almost always good for a couple of reasons. You are working with typically highly talented and skilled people. They would give you feedback on what you're doing wrong. And that can jumpstart your okay, own capabilities to a huge extent. Yeah. You have a proven portfolio that you can point to. Hey, I wrote this piece of code and you're using this piece of code. Why the, hire me? There was this classic example of uh, um, someone who couldn't uh, I, um, uh, brew on an uh, auto or something like that. He failed an interview because he failed some technical question. He's, asked, he's saying, you have standardized on the tool that I wrote and you're telling me that I'm not a, a, a sufficiently smart a, a software developer for you to hire me or something like that. Mm -hmm. So from a branding perspective, from a, a, a growth perspective, everything open source is, right. is great. It, 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 but, it's a great opportunity for expect more junior people to go and kind of cut their teeth and uh, you know build that brand, but also have experience with m much more complex solutions um, than, you know, the, the, the smaller tools, the thing that you build in school, the thing that, you know, it, it, and so it's a, it's a great way to very quickly ramp up and, and into that enterprise software space. So let's talk about um, uh, the, the aspect of school. When you write code for school, you typically uh, write code that is well-defined, short in scope, and throwaway. You, I haven't been able, and I'm 
been trying to push for that. I haven't been able to get a single university to make their uh, uh, CS, the CS department take the degree basically and have them write a single project for the entire thing. So they would have to maintain that and refactor on something like that. Well, that, that's if why you, a lot of schools that will take on legitimate clients, like outside real world, you know, companies that come in and they realize they're working with students, you know, but, you know, they, they say, look, we, we don't have the ability to go hire, you know, really expensive, you know, engineers on this project, but maybe they're also looking for out of the box, more creative solutions. Um, and, and so it can be good on, on both sides, but that is a, a lot of, uh, you know, coding programs like these, uh, you know, uh, uh, six month coding schools, they do that. It's built around real world client projects. Mm -hmm. um, I always say that for, uh, you know, one of I'm a huge advocate. My background is more uh, technical project management. I'm really big on for enterprise softwares, especially pilot, pilot, pilot. And one of the things that the mantras around piloting is don't go pilot on well-defined throwaway fake projects pilot around a real team a real project real uh, you know uh, uh, deliverables and budgets and things around that so that you have a true sense of whether the solution you're looking at can f you know fill that that gap fill that need um but it's it's much the same yeah and in the sense of um growth from open source project moving from students most of the projects most open source projects where you actually have a, a, the chance to go explore something would be something that have been used in production that has been around for a while already have a, a weight around that so here is the maintainability concern here is the legacy craft that we have to support this old opera system or any sort so realistic code bases and realistic problems and in many cases stuff that uh, you wouldn't get to experience until much later in your career but this is for the individual contributor I mean amazing scenario let's talk about what happened for a company and for a company the problem with open source is that I want to pay I want to have an owner, I want to have support, I want to have someone to point the finger says, it's on you. Mm -hmm. And the business model of open source project is not great. If I mentioned the foundation project earlier, and this requires that you manage to solicit enough uh, 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 contributions, enough uh, 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 donations to try to make yourself sustainable. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, Patreon model may be able to get something there, but still highly suspicious of how you can actually uh, make it work. And then let's say that you want to uh, have an open source project and your model for uh, paying for that is to support. And uh, many open source projects are based around that. So we offer the project uh, as is, and then if you want to run it in production, if you want to have uh, to have uh, mommy and daddy that you can call in case of something breaks, then you pay for support. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that model is that it is not easily sustainable, mm -hmm. and people would only buy support when they actually need it. Mm -hmm. Think about the case of if I could buy my car insurance after I had a car accident which means that uh, if, so the car insurance company would very happily sell me a car insurance for a car for an accident. They would just price it to be higher than the price of a car. And that's what ended up happening in this model because everyone just called me at, after the incident happened, and then I have to spend a lot of time and effort, what happened, how to resolve it, something like that. So this becomes really expensive. It also become, uh, it creates perverse incentives. Let's say that I have a, an error that people can make in my software, and it causes a support incident. Well, if I'm making money through support, ka -ching. 
I don't have the, the, the incentive to want to fix that. And then you get to uh, other support models, the Red Hat model, where they provide packaging support, uh, which has a lot of value on its own. But the Red Hat model is pretty much the only company in town. Almost, uh, I cannot think of any other company that have been successful to, with, in the same sense that Reddit did that. Um, and that means that this is not something that can be easily replicated, if at all. And then you move to things like, oh, what happened if I charge you for hosting this as a service? And as a, and then you have two options. Either not enough people are using you, or Amazon is saying, oh, that's a nice service you have there, and it's open source. I'm going to host it. And if you look, you can see Terraform and Elasticsearch and uh, MongoDB and many other projects that have had to change their license from an open source OSI approved license to something else, typically a, a BSL or something like that, uh, which are no longer open source projects. Specifically, I have to make money somehow. And that's a huge, uh, a huge aspect. Uh, so when we talk about the open source and community in general, one of the things that we have to ask ourselves is how do, how do you get, a, a, how do the ma maintainers of these projects actually make money? Whatever this is through sponsorship, through a company, whatever there is a foundation or something. And it's, it's funny that I'm saying that because if this is something that you rely on, you want to know that this is actually something that is viable. And then, by the way, it's also perfectly acceptable to say, oh, I'm going to use this project. And if necessary, I'm going to take ownership of that for my purposes. That's the beauty of doing that in open source. But again, if I, if I have a bug in Babel, which is a JavaScript packager, I believe, uh, then, and I need to fix that, then, I'm probably going to find it easier to just pay someone than trying to understand what it is, how does it work, and what's going on there. Yeah. I just was thinking too, um, you know, going back to, I mean, I'm trying to remember how long ago it was where um, the the battles over Linux and and the various support models for that. But it basically could come down to your point. It's like the, the organizations that were heavily involved in all the open source said, it's like, look, we're, we're spending a lot of money, a lot of time. Like we, we need to, we're spending a lot of support time around this. So we have our flavor of Linux that has this support model, but you've got to pay for it to get that. Uh, again, you get the, the purists that were angry. And I think everybody else that understood um, that it still has its ties too, but it's now branched off. It's a separate product. It's a separate entity now. Um, and there's benefits to that. And there are, and there are downsides to that, that it's not a true open source effort. I'm interested to know, like with you as a, as a startup founder, you talked a little bit about, you know, the beginning, how people started asking, they, it, you know, they heard about it. They found out about it. They wanted us to pay you money for it. You needed to set up around that. How have you leveraged uh, community to build out your own business? Are there lessons to be learned in in so, how to leverage open source? Yeah, so much of the growth in, in RevenDB and adoption has been through word of mouth, through blog, community, stuff like that. Uh, when one of the things that I decided to do very early on with RevenDB is to say, hey, this is open source project. Uh, and so, in terms of a, a pricing model, you have the pairs for support, uh, open call model, and all sorts of other stuff like that. I decided that I I'm going to treat the uh, model as we're in fully open source project. There is no open call. Everything is out in the open. But the soft when you install the software, it says, go and get a license. We have a community license, and if you want something more than that, you go and purchase a, a, a license for, you know, like you would do for commercial software. Uh, 
mm-hmm. and you can, I mean, the source is out there. You can go and says, oh, I'm going to disable the check. And that would mean that uh, you would have to run your own uh, uh, deployment of RevenDB because we will not be uh, managing that, supporting that, something like that. And that, I think, has been a, a, a huge impact on adoption because it also makes sense in the way that, oh, I know that I'm paying for software, I'm paying for uh, a word processor, I'm paying whatever I'm paying for uh, Outlook or Google Docs or whatever. Organizations have no problems paying for software. Mm -hmm. But asking for donations, this is actually a huge issue. If I want to, if, uh, oh, you want to donate money? Sure, we have a donation uh, funds for that. Here is the list of 3,000 uh, uh, requirements that you have to deal with. Or your, uh, uh, your organization in the Netherlands, but I need you to be 5013C, which is, I think, a tax designation in the US, right. in order for you to be able to accept a, a, donation. a donation. Right. Yeah. Yep. But if you are a company and you just send me an invoice, then I just throw that into my expensive. I don't need to think about it. So a, a lot of that is actually around how you model things, how you understand how businesses consider money and most businesses have no issues and are very well used to actually pay money to get stuff but they would not be paying money for oh because i uh, because i like that they don't want to they don't they need to have a a, a reason to do that and the moment that you give them both a reason and a, a commercially acceptable way of doing that they would generally have no problem with doing this and that is a, a, a huge aspect here. Yeah. Well, I know that uh, there's there's a lot more. As we were talking about before we started recording, there's a few different conversations that we need to have. Maybe next time we see each other uh, in, in person around this. But mm-hmm. you know, Oren, I really appreciate your your insights into leveraging open source um, and and community in general. We'll have to do something where we'll talk specifically around your role and as as an MVP what you're doing in that space uh, a different time, different day. But uh, for folks that do want to find out more about you, get in touch and contact you, where are you most active in social? Where can people find you? Uh, I have a blog at ayende.com slash blog. I would throw the link in here so you can see that. And I also, if you want to see where what I'm actually working on day, then go to revenue.net and take a peek on that it is even if i'm saying that a really really cool database and i think that we manage to get the hassle out of your database excellent i'll just point out too that uh, i think it was uh you know in dilbert that dilbert and the sidekick uh you know the you know the answer to any question of you know what should we do with the product was well we can build a database <laughs> and uh, the boss is the boss pointy haired boss it's like you know why is your answer always build a database it's like well we just like building databases so uh, it's <laughs> uh the, the the one the deal that i really really liked was uh we need to build a, a no sql database i hear it, it's the best thing and you hear a thought bubble does he know what he's asking for and then you then he asks what color do you want it? He says, I think purple is nice. <laughs> I think like, I do remember that one. I'm going to have to go look those up though. Maybe I'll post those in the blog <laughs> if I can find them. So, but uh, well, I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've been listening to the Collab Talk podcast. New episodes are published weekly, and you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and most other podcast platforms. Thanks for listening.